Welcome everyone um, to our joint uh, Broad MIT EECS um, colloquium, which is um, co-hosted by AINT and EECS and the Eric and Wendy Schmidt Center here at the Broad. Um, we're super excited to have today uh, Jennifer Liss-Garten. Um, as you all know, if you've been coming to our colloquium series, we try to invite uh, people here who not only bring uh, machine learning techniques uh, towards answering important questions in biology, biomedical sciences, drug discovery, etc. But in particular, also go the other way around of trying to understand the most important problems and then actually have that motivate uh, new methods in machine learning. And so we're hearing a lot about that today. So Jennifer has worked on a broad variety of topics and has more recently actually changed topics. Um, so she, when she was still here, so she got her PhD in, in Toronto and then spent 10 years um, here next door at Microsoft Research um, and was then still working on a lot of questions in genetics and genomics, uh, particular genome-wide association studies um, for very, you know, uh, complex phenotypes, um, and then moved to UC Berkeley and has since uh, been working a lot on protein design, engineering, optimization, and all of the methods have always been like somewhere in the intersection of variational inference, um, Bayesian optimization, graphical models, neural networks. Um, so I'm very excited to hear what Jennifer will tell us about today in terms of protein design. So welcome, Jennifer, and thanks for being here. Thanks for that uh, nice introduction. Um, and it's fun, and my, my former collaborator, John, is here, who I haven't seen in five years. So uh, yeah, this is great. And so, right, I have started in the past five years thinking about and working on protein engineering. And so I actually sometimes feel a little bit ridiculous because I'm, I'm pretending to be an expert here. It's, I'm relatively new, but, uh, but I think I have something to say, and hopefully you will as well. So the Broad actually marketing team tried to get me to change the title. I think they thought this was too low key. Uh, and But I, I demanded that it remain. <laughs> so today I'm going to give you uh, an introduction I wish someone had <laughs> given me on protein engineering a few years ago and just kind of talk about like what are the problems there, uh, what has been solved, what hasn't been solved, what's the role of alpha fold and stuff like this. And then I'm going to just give you like a very um, like a one slide uh, just sense of what my group is thinking about in that space, which, and in particular, I'm trying not to be in the crowded part of that space and to bring to bear my own expertise on this problem. And then I'm gonna go into a bit of a deeper but still uh, limited time dive into two projects in my group, um, one centered on engineering AAV for gene therapy. And this is a new one which should go live on BioArchive uh, sometime today that I haven't talked about. So, great. Uh, so I probably don't have to convince people in this audience that proteins uh, are important for a huge range of problems in society, from therapeutics to the environment. Uh, you know, recycling, uh, this is an enzyme pedase that recycles the plastic bottles that I see a few of, but not very many. Mm, if one could do better in engineering Rubisco, it could help with biosequestration of carbon dioxide. I think we all know about gene therapy, we know about gene editing, we know about antibodies. We um, can also produce antibiotics and biofuel with these things at scale. So just really tremendous opportunity here. And at a very fundamental level, this, why, this is a challenging, challenging problem because uh, like, like most real problems, it has a, a, just a massive space of things we need to think about. And in particular, we get this kind of combinatorial explosion by thinking about just designing a sequence where each element comes from a 20 amino acid uh, alphabet. And so, right, proteins are, you know, whatever, let's say a few hundred amino acids long, and already at 100 amino acids, the number of possible strings you could get from that amino alphabet already far exceeds the number of atoms in the universe. And so it seems, you know, naively, if you look at this, you walk away and you go pick another problem. But of course, we know that nature has, <laughs> has managed to navigate this space, and it's not totally useless, right? Of course, nature took millions and millions of years to make very small changes uh, and slowly accumulate useful things and, and be able to change them. And so we know there's some hope, and so there's uh, this idea that we could engineer these uh, separately using our own techniques, which are not natural evolution. And so this, of course, also has a long history, not as long as natural evolution. So, so how have people done this up until now? By, and by now, I mean <laughs> machine learning taking over the world. So there's two main ways people have done this. One is what people call this sort of biophysics-based or energy-based approach, and that's the, this top one here. So, of course, David Baker at the University of Washington basically is the, has been the lead in this field for decades. 
And the central sort of technology, if you will, there is a uh, approximation to physics using all pairs of atoms in an energy field and, and various terms that approximate physics to a good enough extent that uh, you get something useful while simultaneously being computationally tractable. And then you can think about how might I use that to, to do structure prediction or figure out sequ all, all kinds of things. They, they repurpose and reuse it in different ways. And so, right, that has a long history. Well, depending how old you are, uh, that, I think that's pretty long. And so I say almost rest in peace. So almost rest in peace because David Baker surprisingly took very long to get on the machine learning bandwagon, but he did, and he's doing great stuff there. Uh, but there are actually some problems for which uh, they, they still use, uh, I actually don't know if his lab does, but other people in the world still use this energy function instead of alpha fold and, and similar models to that, which David has reproduced in his lab. So it's not quite dead, and it'll be interesting to see when it becomes completely dead. But the, and then the second one, which you, of course, have also heard of because they got the Nobel Prize in 2018, is a purely wet lab endeavor where you kind of say, uh, instead of nature directing evolution, I'm going to impose my own fitness selection on a population, right? So I'm going to start with a protein. I'm going to diversify it at, ra at random using some stochastic mechanism, for example, um, error-prone uh, error PCR or recombination libraries and these kinds of ideas. So you diversify with the stochastic mechanism, and then you need some way to measure in the lab the thing you want to engineer for uh, or a good proxy to it. You select those that are sc scoring more highly on that property, and then you, you keep going around. And so from a computer science point of view, this is uh, doing a very uh, local greedy search until it hits a local optimum. And this is one of the problems, is you can't move very far before just the whole protein kind of collapses. Of course, it works well enough that it got a Nobel Prize. So it does great things, but it, there's a, a lot it still can't do. And so, right, and so what is now, of course, emerging is this idea of how can we bring machine learning in? And machine learning is coming in to both of these areas. And I would say at the moment, the literature of how it's helping each of these is a little bit different, but th there's a lot of interrelatedness there, and I expect that they're going to uh, eventually converge in, in some ways. And, and even here, they end up at the end having to kind of fine tune with wet lab experiments. They don't say it's directed evolution, but it is a kind of lightweight directed evolution. Okay, so when people find out that I'm working on protein engineering, they say, oh, well, didn't AlphaFold solve your problem? Like, like what are you working on? AlphaFold <laughs> solve the problem. And so I'd like to address this from the very beginning and say, like, AlphaFold is, a, is really a breakthrough. It's incredible. I've not worked in this area of, right, so what did they do? They, you give it a sequence and it predicts the structure, and it's very, very good at that in a way that no, the world has never seen until this came, basically. And so, but why is this, this is a very useful tool for protein engineering, but AlphaFold, first of all, it goes from sequence to structure. And so if you need to design a drug or an enzyme to do something, you don't know the sequence, first of all, nor, nor, nor do you typically know the structure. So obviously you can't just use it that way. You might think, well, what if I could, what if I had the reverse model? What if I could go from structure to sequence? These are now called inverse folding models. And maybe that's a bit more useful. Maybe if, because I, I might know the structure for some drug and then I could design the sequence. And so these kinds of models are emerging, but actually you don't usually even know the structure, right? Maybe, maybe in some cases, maybe you know the active site, the catalytic site or something, and for some reason you want to design around it and so forth. But in general, if you say, I want to hit that target and I don't like really know what binds to it, then you know neither the structure nor the sequence, right? And so, it, so AlphaFold absolutely doesn't solve this problem, but it's an incredibly useful tool to solve a number of problems in protein engineering. And so what is the major, in my opinion, one of the major challenges is precisely that we don't know which sequences or which structures produce the desired function, uh, unless we've already observed it. But often we're trying to design things for which we've never seen a protein that can do that. And so I, I personally got very <laughs> disoriented in this field because I would read some paper and they'd say, ah, we like solved this problem. And I thought, oh, 
like, did they just solve protein engineering? What should I be working on now? And then I realized, actually, there's like different ways to slice and dice this. And so, uh, so on this slide, I'm going to tell you about just what some people call the prediction tasks in the field. And the next slide, I'll explain what some people call the design tasks. But so what is AlphaFold is going from is predicting the structure, the 3D structure from the sequence. Uh, another thing that people do, including my group, is to try to predict the function from the sequence or to predict the function from both the sequence and the structure. And, and that's where I actually think that we, we have a lot, uh, there's a long way to go here and a lot of interesting things. Uh, all the other problems are also interesting, but I think this really is a bottleneck one that's not going to be solved by scale because we've measured so few things in biology that we care about. And so and now we talk about design, and this is where I used to tell people I was doing protein design, and they say, no, 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 you're not. Protein design means I give you a structure, you tell me a sequence. And so I, I think that is, uh, that's what I now call this, and I think other people call this structure-based design, but uh, another design might be I tell you the function and you tell me the sequence. I'm going to design the sequence or I'm going to design the structure. So I, and so what, as, if you're interested in this field and you're trying to look at papers, I think it's useful to understand which problem that paper is tackling and what range of applications that's useful for and what it's not useful for, because it can be very misleading to, to think like, oh, that, that paper maybe just solved all of protein engineering. Okay, so that's sort of an overview, and now I want to just tell you, having amassed an overview of what's going on in this field of machine learning, like what are some of the trends, what are people doing with machine learning in this space in general? And so the first one is what, uh, what people like to call representation learning, uh, which is, it's interesting, I wonder if, the stat if statisticians use that term at all, but because really what that is, it's learning just a density, like uh, from an unsupervised model, right? It says, give me a bunch of sequences, and then just learn a density model over it. And just in the modern day, these models, instead of having just a mean and a variance, they often have like hidden layers, I often written as Z, and you just extract one of these layers and you say, huh, I wonder if that's a good representation that I can use. So instead of encoding with ACTG or a one hot version of that, you take this representation and now you build regression models on top of that in the hopes that it's sort of presenting um, a more uh, it's sitting, let's say, on a, on a lower dimensional or more useful manifold. And people do this in two ways. Sometimes they amass all of like a giant database from like UNIREF or whatever and just take you know, millions and millions of proteins. Or sometimes they do it just with a family. So they'll take like a, a wild type sequence for a, has a property they're interested in. They'll do a homology search to curate a set of related proteins and then build the model just on that, hoping that then that model, its density, for example, may correlate with that particular property or something like this. So, so that's one big area, that, and it's sort of like almost every week there's, a, there's another one, and the, the big tech companies have, have gotten into this game. They often repurpose their big NLP engines, and then they call them their giant language models, which is now what we call all these models in, in protein science. So, and then now, of course, uh, generative models in a number of fields have become quite exciting and, and interesting, and protein science is no exception. So there's two main kinds of generative modeling happening. One is to generate sequences. And again, like these can even even if the models aren't strictly speaking probabilities, mostly they have an interpretation of being such. And so the idea is to say, either just in general, again, like suppose um, ah, sorry, right. And here the idea is to design a sequence. And so the idea might be I'm going to condition the generative model on some design condition that I would like. And the condition might be structure in which case I'm doing inverse folding. I'm giving it a structure and saying to the model, you tell me the sequence that will fold into this structure. And there's been a tiny bit of work on, on what this sort of control tag condition where you actually give it like an English term from maybe an ontology or a protein family and you say, make me a coresmate mutase protein. Um, I, I personally don't think this one's super useful uh, and there's been less work here and, and this one is, is quite popular. So uh, the third one is a generative model, not for the sequence, but for the structure. And so these, these, are, these are just coming out now. So John Ingraham, who uh, is, I think, in the, in the neighborhood here, is, is one of the, has done a, put out a beautifully large, um, very 
technically rigorous paper, and also the Baker Lab has put one out. And these are using these diffusion models, which you may have heard of because they're very uh, popular, especially with DALI and these, these image uh, type of approaches. But the idea here is a generative model for the 3D structure, like the, the backbone in particular, uh, which is just how that sort of 2D strand waves around <laughs> through space. And here, you, again, you give it, uh, sorry, you can do it unconditionally. So you can just say, just sample anything that looks like a real protein that kind of obeys the laws of physics of what that backbone could look like. And you can do it also uh, conditionally. And so conditionally means you generate the backbone conditioned on something you desire, some sort of function. And the function could be um, that it's part of a backbone maybe, like maybe you know some part of it like that has to do with the active site and you wanna hold that and you want to design the rest. Or it might uh, be some, the function might be like I want you to bind to that target. And so I think something get, that gets missed out in these papers a little bit is that no matter what you're trying to condition on, you need to know uh, the, essentially at some level inside of there, whether it's not whether it's visible or not, you need to kind of know how to predict that functionality given the backbone. Like, because you can't get something for nothing. And so for some of the um, diffusion models, they guide this unconditional generative process with signal from just such a classifier. It's called classifier guided diffusion. So just kind of want to highlight that even though there's great work here and it's very interesting and they're doing very useful things, there's a large number of functions for which we don't know this, and therefore, even though these diffusion models seem really amazing, like they're very limited by this particular uh, thing here. This is what's sometimes called fitness prediction, which we've also been doing some work on, even though I used to say this is not an interesting problem, but it turns out it is an interesting problem. And so the idea is how can I actually get at this thing for a number of different functionalities? Like, I suppose I want an, an enzyme that ca catalyzes a particular reaction. If you give me the sequence, can I tell you how well it will catalyze that reaction? That's what this is. And, and this, for in general, for different functionalities is extraordinarily hard. And we have very, very little data and often no data before we collect stuff in the lab. And so one of the things that, that people have started to do, it has quite a long history, is to grab evolutionary data, which is actually one of the main driving forces of also how AlphaFold works, these multiple sequence alignments. And so how might that work? Suppose you want to um, get a, a zero shot model, meaning I have no labeled data of how well a protein is able to fluoresce green. So you say, well, I know that like GFP fluoresces green. I mean, this is a bit of a toy example because we know a lot about GFP, but in general, you take GFP and then you go uh, use an evolutionary search algorithm like Jackhammer that's looking for things that are close in evolutionary space. And you, you collect all of these and then you train a model on these and the hopes that all of those proteins are enriched for the function you care about. And actually you, you build a density just like you do in representation learning. And then you, you ask like, uh, how well does a test sequence score under that density model? So that's one way that people are doing this. They're also doing it on sort of pen um, proteome data sets as well, and, it, and, it, and then fine tuning them and, and everything in between like, like everybody does. So, okay. And then just the last one I'll say is, yeah, AlphaFold sort of solves um, protein folding, but there are still like yes and no. Uh, these are some of the kind of, let's say, you could call them corner cases, although some of them are, are quite big. So it doesn't, it really does rely on this evolutionary information. And so one of the challenges at the moment is to say, well, what if I have what's called an orphan protein, meaning that it doesn't really have homologs in the databases. So it turns out if you feed those orphan proteins to alpha fold, it doesn't get a multiple sequence alignment, it doesn't have that information, and it does very poorly. So people are trying to tackle that problem. Also, at the moment, they've, they've managed to coerce it to figure out how um, multiple things can bind or come together if they don't undergo conformational changes. But if you want to understand binding, where which typically does undergo a conformational change, then it does very poorly there. And also, at the end of the day, these are distributions, like, like in probabilities, right, over conformations. And all of this is about static here. And so that there's, you know, there's a lot more to do, even though a lot has been done. 
Okay, so that's sort of my, my overview. I, I kind of put that together for myself. Hopefully you enjoyed it too. Um, so now I'll just give you a sense of the kind of work that we've been doing, which mostly isn't gonna refer to anything I just said. Um, but, but what is it gonna refer to? So it, it is, it's gonna actually refer a lot, basically a lot of this. So anytime you're trying to design a protein or engineer a protein to do something, the, the something is this F. And usually the way we bootstrap ourselves up is that sometimes a bit like this, and then we collect some data, and we have this model that predicts the function we're trying to engineer from the sequence or from the structure. And so, but then we're trying to, like now we have some understanding of that function, uh, functional relationship between sequence and, or that relationship between sequence and function, but we often want to extrapolate in the sense that we've actually never seen a protein that does the thing we want. So whatever that property is, we wanna push it uh, past what we know about. And so we're sort of by definition in many cases going into extrapolative space from what our models currently can do and what they currently know about. And, just, and in general, so if you, if you look here, this is, this is sort of a classic Gaussian process picture. These red points are training data, and it's, a, it's just for visualization, but this applies in general. Near the training data, if you had good coverage uh, in this area of the space, then you would actually fit the ground truth uh, quite well. Sorry, the ground truth is, is this guy here. And as you get further away from the training data, you have this massive uncertainty, and you don't know anything, right? And so in some sense, when we're trying to design new proteins, we're always kind of going into this crazy territory where we don't know anything. And so there's always this tension between how much can I squeeze my model for what it already knows versus, and how much can I push it further to get to where I want to be and how can I think about that trade-off when should I collect new data and these kinds of questions and so we spent quite a lot of time on these and I, I think I will not talk about them today sometimes I don't know until I hit slide advance uh, and then another thing is, is our inductive biases, right? So inductive biases in modern day machine learning, what do they mean? It means like, how am I encoding some knowledge of the domain into the model so that I've pinned it down and it doesn't have so many degrees of freedom? And so actually convolutional neural networks are like an inductive bias that came from computer vision that said sort of spatial nearness has, has um, some meaning and translation doesn't change the meaning of like an eye is an eye, whether it's here or here. And so in general, in, in a lot of application domains, people wait for these advances to be made in, in the core machine learning areas like NLP and computer vision, and then they grab them, right? So we have convolutional neural networks and transformers all over the place in biology and so forth. But I think that there's also a place to sort of rethink, like, what might we have missed if we want to think about biology and this hadn't been so... Uh, in, impacted by those other fields. And I, I think actually a lot of the stuff from the other fields is very useful and can often be ported over, but it's also worth periodically stopping and saying, is there something I should also inject that's maybe as general as those, but related to biology? And so, uh, so we've just done a tiny little bit of, of work on this that I, I won't talk about. But what, actually, I will talk about this and something related to this. Um, which is uh, quite actually different from all this extrapolation stuff here, although not completely, but it's this idea of how to design libraries of proteins. So when I first started thinking of the problem of protein engineering, I just made up in my head what it was, and I thought I'm gonna just decide like one or a few sequences that, like, yeah, uh, that I would give to a collaborator and they'll synthesize them and they'll check. But in reality, the way a lot of protein engineering works, particularly the people who historically did directed evolution, is they make large, large libraries of proteins, right? And so it, large is a bit in the eye of the beholder. It depends on your assay and what you care about. So like Francis, Arnold, who measures a lot of catalysis, usually measures like three or four hundred things. My collaborator that I'm going to talk about uh, in a moment, we I often get measurements for ten to the seven things um, through sequencing, high throughput sequencing, and so. Um, so when you start designing massive libraries of things, and I'll explain, what, yeah, I'll explain what this means in a, in a moment, but you, you get into a number of interesting questions as a computer scientist that are also useful to the people in the wet lab. And so actually this is gonna be the, the in a moment I'll dive in, but I, I like to, before I dive into that, I just wanna highlight this sort of issue of what goes wrong if you just trust a model when you use it for a machine learning based design. So 
in some level, one way you can think about machine learning based design is that you have a trained model that goes from, let's say, sequence to function. So, and uh, so, or structure, I, so I put structure to function, it could be either one. And the idea is that I have this model that predicts the property I care about, and in a sense, I'm going to invert it. Like someone's given it to me or I trained it, and now I want to design protein. So I want to design the structure or the sequence. And so I'm going to invert this thing, and, but then I have to remember it. Well, what happens if I, if I am going into extrapolation space. And so this is a very nice analogy that I think drives home the point nicely, which is if you, and this is actually, I have taken, sorry, I apologize, I, I lost a lot of my, my credits uh, in the last year, but I think this is from a Google website. A blog where they had a, a, a expert trained classifier to do object recognition and each node here was a different class so this was like the banana node are you a banana Pro what probability are you a pear what probability and so forth all the way up to like whatever zebra uh, and, and any, anything and so then the question they had was they were not designing a banana we don't need to design a banana way we plant a banana tree what they wanted to know was what does my network think a banana looks like but it turns out that that process of them trying to understand what their network thinks a banana looks like is, for me, machine learning based design because I'm, they're inverting the network. So what they do is they set this banana node to one and they set the other nodes to zero. They've already trained this network, the state of the art network. And then they start with a random image here and they do gradient descent backwards to update the image instead of to update the knobs or the parameters of the network. And so, and so when you do that, this is what comes out is you get abstract art and and so now they you know and so people kind of patch you know they find that out and then they can patch it up in different ways but the analogy here is that if you're trying to design something and you're trying to set this property to something really high so high that you've never seen it and then you squeeze this network which is sort of full of pathological holes because it doesn't know about a large regions of the space then you're going to probably get out an unfolded protein and, and actually, we ignored this, and then we started uh, doing this process, and then my student said, you know, I'm not a protein engineer, but this looks like garbage to me, and it turns out this was the problem. So I just, well, I'm not gonna go into the work. So we have a number of work on, on, on themes related to this uh, that I won't go into, but I just wanted to like, leave you with that as a thought in terms of just machine learning-based design. Why, why does that work so badly? I mean, I, yeah, I get it. I get, I get yours. You're squeezing the network hard, like. Oh, I'm, you know what? I but, I'm so upset because the next slide I always put in would explain it, and I took it out today. Okay. So, like, I mean, <laughs> so okay. So why not just? Uh, I mean, I, I know this isn't going to work, but why does this not work? Set the probability to 0.9 on the mm -hmm. uh, banana, and the others give like some okay, small weight. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. The question is, this is exactly it. This is the tension between how much can I push the network? Is how, what do I set that value to? So, but, but I, I presume that there's no way to get a banana out through just path propagation. On the I actually didn't do it, but I'm not sure what happens. If it's, a, it's an interesting question. If you go down enough, do you get out a coherent banana or not? My guess is probably not, but I, this is also a different domain. And so I would say, in, like in the examples I am familiar with, if you dial it down enough, I think you do start to get stuff that's sort of sensible out, but also then you get stuff you already know about that doesn't have as high a property as you want. And so this is sort of the conundrum. Um, and in some sense, it's an unsolvable conundrum. And so our work is sort of saying, like, how can I think about it? How can I navigate this in order to do better? Uh, oh, I did put those in, but OK. Mm. Uh, no, I'm, I'm going to just skip these so I have time. If I have time at the end, I'll, I'll loop back. So, right, so we spend a lot of time in our sort of pie in the sky machine learning thinking in these kinds of ways, and, and we write papers like that. But also, really, as John knows, I like to go for drinks with collaborators, so I therefore collaborate. And, uh, and so, what, we have a number of ongoing collaborations, of which this is the longest standing uh, David Schaefer. And so, I'm going to tell you sort of a, like, a, a a summary of several years' work on a pretty simple system with actually pretty simple methods, but it's like a real problem, and I think the progress we've made is real, and we're now generalizing much of what I'm going to tell you, but it, it's not uh, it's not wrapped up yet, so I, I can't talk about it. And then uh, and then I'll and then I'll give you an this was motivated by that, so I'll also explain that. So right, so this is a multi-year collaboration with my uh, with who's David's at Cal. He's been doing directed evolution for 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 many years. 
and we started to work together to see how could we improve some of the things that he cares about using machine learning. And so he, in particular, is very focused on AAV, uh, the adeno-associated virus for which uh, I think there's probably people here at the Broad who, be who believe, and well, and actually it, it, it's true, it is being used already for, for gene therapy as a vehicle for gene delivery. So if you could design the capsid of the protein to go to the right cell types and you had the right payload, then you, uh, you might be able to do something useful. So, right, and so actually it, it is, in fact, he has a company that's already has a drug that's gone through FDA approval, so this is really real stuff. Uh, however, it's also a whole, whole lot of problems in terms of getting it to work beyond that, the few cases where it does work. And so some of those problems are that basically, for example, most of us in this room have already been exposed to that virus, which means that if you use a gene therapy, immediately your immune system goes and attacks it before it can do what it needs to. So you'd like to make it uh, not get shut down by your immune system. Also, you don't want it to activate your immune system in a bad way either. Uh, another big problem is at the moment it's, it's primarily deployed in the brain where the, because of the blood-brain barrier and it can't shut stuff down. But there's, uh, even there, there's a number of cell types. They just cannot get the virus to infect. Um, but not only in the brain. Or sometimes you can get it to infect uh, the cell type you want, but it's also infecting a bunch of other cell types. So there's a number of properties that, for more general use, we need to be able to change about the AAV capsid protein. So And so what we decided to do as our, as our very first uh, project, this, this probably started in 2018. I guess everything got shut down for a while, but it's, and it's been a lot of iterations between my group and Dave's group. And so the idea here was that no matter what property you want to select on, you, you're going to have some starting library. And so what he does, actually, so the library we use is actually not the whole gene. It's actually a 21 nucleotide window that gets inserted into a specific part of the, the capsid. And so normally what they do is they take, the, for the starting library, they start with a uniform distribution, just over ACTG at each position. And then they, they put it through multiple rounds of directed evolution and hope that they get what they want. Uh, and then there's tricks about how do you get multiple properties uh, that are also quite difficult that I won't talk about. But what Dave said is, the, this is, the problem is the very first library, we were wasting half the budget. Because when you start with this uniform property, the half of the AAVs, they just don't function. Like they're just garbage and they, you can't use them for anything no matter what you care about. And so our very first goal was to say, well, could we redesign the starting library so that we have a more generally useful library for any downstream selection that we don't even know about yet and it's not trained for in the sense that let's get uh, as close to uniform in a sense as we can while maintaining uh, the packaging ability, the sort of general survivability, if you will, of the virus uh, for the whole library. And if we can do that, then we basically get twice as many shots on goal from the get-go. And so that was the goal here. And, and, uh, and so, uh, right, so, uh, and the way we do this is, right, so this is seven, is seven amino acids, 21 nucleotides. And basically this is, uh, these are the like stochastic knobs I get to control. I'm not saying synthesize this whole gene. I'm saying use these knobs for your stochastic mechanism to generate your library. So initially he was, he's been using roughly speaking uniform. It's actually NNK to reduce stop codons. And I think this might be one of the ones we designed here. Uh, I need to get it redone in nucleotide space, but this, these are the amino acids. And so the whole game here is to basically get a library uh, where we pick theta. Theta is the individual value of each of these probabilities over uh, essentially ACTG at each of 21 uh, positions. And we want uh, the, the entropy of the distribution to be as high as possible, for which uniform is the highest. But then we have uh, another term in this objective function, which is the average packaging ability, according to our machine learning model f of x for packaging ability, which we trained on his initial data using the standard library. Does that make sense? And, and in this is a very simple set of knobs. It's the marginal probability at each position of each nucleotide. But we also have much more complex knobs having to do with recombination libraries and so forth. But this one's also very easy to understand. So the whole game here was how do we set this knob differently from uniform so that we get a library where we don't waste half of it and it's as diverse as possible so we get as many lottery tickets as possible. So we took the standard library, they did some high throughput sequencing, and we get a lab now we have labels from sequences, 21 mer inserts, uh, to the label, and we train the model 
Uh, I'm not going to explain in great detail what all, all of this is, but we check how well it does at predicting. We use a number of fairly simple models, including just linear models with um, simple epistatic terms. And in the end, a simple neural network kind of worked the best, so that's what we used. But this is sort of not the interesting part here. Mm, and then we said, well, how well, so one problem here is that these sequencing reads, right, so basically we get a starting library and then we put it through a packaging selection and we have a post selection library for which the things the package survived and then we get read counts from the two conditions and we take essentially like the ratio uh, tells you how, how well a particular sequence uh, could, could package. But this is a very much a proxy. Uh, there's a number of issues that emerge from these sequencing data. So we wanted to check just by actually measuring the viral titers, does this thing really package? And so we picked four points that span the range of, of um, sort of packaging and that were not in the training data. And then we measured the viral titers and showed that actually, yeah, the model does work well on the actual thing we care about. Uh, you, I don't know. Uh, it, I mean, it, it's a full, I mean, what he packages is the whole thing that is the standard AAV with this insertion in the, in the. It says uh, I, yes, I believe, uh, I'm actually, I, I always forget. Uh, I think it, it, it is in the paper, yeah, I, I forget those details. Bad, bad, bad. Um, Okay, uh, oh, sorry, that those were poor answers, but. So, and so something that's really nice here that I haven't seen in any other protein engineering papers that I think is important is that fundamentally, I have a trade-off between how diverse the library is and how much I expect it to package well. So, uh, and so this is this objective function, and lambda is a trade-off parameter between how well you package and how diverse you are. So in the most extreme end over here, I have something that packages extraordinarily well, but there's no diversity in the library. In fact, this library basically contains one sequence of 21 nucleotides that packages best, and that's all I get. So that's, that's useless, right? And on the other extreme, actually this X here is the standard library data has been using for a number of years. It, uh, it's highly diverse, it's basically close to uniform, but it has terrible packaging and it wastes half of itself. And so basically what we could do is by using this model and, and doing some optimization by changing lambda, we can trace out this path here from no diversity to high diversity. And this is what we, you know, a per, what we call Pareto optimal frontier, mm -hmm. meaning that every point on here is, is optimal, it's just it's making a different trade off. But, and if you have any verticality in one of these optimality curves, it means that anything in that vertical that's above, this is categorically better. There's no trade off because this is that standard library and here's our design library. So for the same diversity, we automatically get much, much better packaging. And so there's no question that this is a better library than this. As for whether this is better than this or this is better than this, then it becomes a bit more in the eye of the beholder. But here at least we have a tool to see when there's clear ones and kind of where there are trade off spots that we might consider. So we made a couple of these libraries again, and just to check, is the titer, overall titer of the entire library reflective of what we anticipated from this curve? And so, and you can see here, this is NNK is this, and then D3 is here, and then D2 is here. So indeed, it is going up in the, in the way we expect. So also, so far, so good. Uh, and now this is the real kind of punchline. So everything I've shown you here, we measured packaging, uh, we trained a model on packaging, we did some computations to create different libraries that trade off packaging with diversity. And now the hope was that if we made a new library, it would be good for any downstream selection that so far we don't even know about. And so on this next slide, this is what we said. We said, you know what, it's very challenging to infect certain brain cells. Um, let's see if the new library we created, even though it's unaware of that property, will do better just because it's given us more shots on goal by not having wasted half the library. And so indeed, uh, when we do that, this uh, it's, it's a bit hard to count and quantify, and I don't want to go into the nuances, but you can read it in, in the paper. But our machine learning design library sort of was vastly better able to infect these brain cells. And so this is sort of a and proof of principle, and, and not more than that, actually. Actually, Dave now uses this as his starting library all the 
time now. Like he will never use this library again for this type of stuff. And so that was start, sort of the point, is can we design a general purpose thing? And so of course there's much more to do here. So that just says now we have a good starting library and we continue to move along to, to tackle further problems as well. Okay. Um, so this, I just, I just made these slides this morning or on the airplane, and so this, yeah, this should go live on BioArchive, I think, today, and I, I really like this. This is gonna be very, very simple, but I, I think I'm really curious to see. Uh, so we thought about this just from a protein engineering perspective, but I think it has broader implications, and it's just this idea of counting sequences between two conditions and computing like a log enrichment score. And, and this happens all over. And so we just, um, for various reasons, we started rethinking this problem. And I think we now have a much, much better <laughs> way to do it. Um, so, right, so I glossed over a little bit. Where did those labels come from in that previous project? Like I said, this is how well it packages. Okay, like, so what was that thing? So what we do is we have this initial library, the pre-selection library, which is like, it was uniform before Dave met us. And then we sequence it. And for each unique sequence X, we count how many times it appeared, right? Yeah. This remember right now this project. Sorry, in this project uh, right here, this is just a 21 nucleotide window. So I'm just for every everything in here. I everything else is constant. So at the moment, I'm just counting for each 21 nucleotide window. How often did it appear? And there's what's that? There is no, there's no, it's literally just measure that 21 nucleotides and just however many unique versions are count how often they happen. So there's no other, there's no notion of inversion or other kinds of genomic processes here. There might be in other settings, but here there's not. Yeah. And then we put it through, oh, huh, okay. We put it through a selection process. We get the post sequencing library. And we also now have counts for the pre and the post for each unique sequence that appears. Right? These are just standard things that we do. And now what do I do to get the log enrichment? I compute basically the, the ratio of how many were in the post to the pre. And the higher that is, the more the post is enriched for the selection. And therefore, there, like that tells me something like that sequence kind of has that property. right? And the more enriched it is, the more it has the property that was selected for. These are just normalization by the total read counts in the pre and post. And so this is a very standard quantity and there's no real <laughs> reason to question it. But it turns out there is a reason to question it. So, so what is a, there's a number of problems um, which, and if it had just been for, for this one and that one, we probably wouldn't have got there. But so I'll, I'll say what they all are, which is that when these counts are fairly low, which they can be in many settings, it's a very high variance estimate. And actually, if you have very long reads, it could be that these are mostly even zeros and ones, and you don't really have quantitative information there because the chances that you get that same long read happening multiple times is almost uh, impossible. So it's high variance, uh, and the longer the count, uh, the longer the sequence you're you're counting over, the higher the variance because you're just going to have it's going to explode very badly. And another problem is for we are interested often in negative selection experiments in the sense that say we want selectivity of cell of cell infection for AAV, we want it to infect this cell type but not that cell type. And so we have like a negative selection on the cell type we don't want, but we can only measure that it did infect the cell, and yet we're interested in the signal for the ones with like really low counts. And this, this is highly problematic here for similar reasons. Another issue is that uh, suppose the, the, there's the normalizing constants are the same, then uh, 1 over 10 post to pre looks the same as 10 over 100. And so you can kind of get around this in some ways, which we have in our other papers, but it's not built in here. It's like a, a separate step. And this is actually how we ended up stumbling into what I'm about to tell you, which is we started getting into cases where the reads didn't cover what I call the sequence of interest. So in the, in the project I told you about, it's just a 21 nucleotide window. So we just, we just you know, throw reads on that, and then we count them, and it's only 21 nucleotides. We get lots of counts. Everything's very easy. 
But as we go to like longer, sometimes we do recombination libraries and we need to sequence the whole genome and we need to count how many times in a sense that genome occurred. Uh, and you could think of like breaking it up or, well, well first of all, we don't often have reads that long. So, but even if we did, uh, they're so long that you can't compute this. But more importantly, just like when you have short reads, how do you get these counts for your sequence? for the sequence of interest. Like, you'd have to kind of sew them together. And, you know, so in, in some areas where, I, I guess, in RNA seq and so where they think people like align reads and then they kind of do some truncation and sort of stuff like this, um, we're not, we don't have to do alignment in our case. We have like a well-defined sequence of interest and we're just getting read counts. And so we're trying to say like, how can we kind of just do something straightforward that naturally handles this. And so that's how we, and, and also we, in one of our collaborations, we had short and long reads that we wanted to do. So how do you start counting when you're tiling with short, with long? And so this is how we got into this particular viewpoint. So, uh, so one way to think about this, and I'll, this is just gonna be a little easy sketch of what we did, which is, is quite simple, is to say that really this, the number of a uh, particular sequence um, divided by the total number of read counts is just a sample-based estimate of a population frequency of that sequence in my library. And that's true for the pre and for the post. Um, and I'm just gonna denote each of those as a, as a distribution for which this is the sample-based uh, frequency uh, of, the, of it. And now, um, what I can say is that this log enrichment people have been computing is a sample-based estimate of the population level frequency. So this is like, I'm not doing anything fancy here at all. I'm just basically saying this is really what we're estimating in a sample-based way. And um, so this is actually what in, in statistics or machine learning you might call a density ratio. This is a density, and this is a density, and, and there's a ratio, so it's a density ratio. And uh, it's like a, quite a classical problem in a number of areas. In particular in machine learning, it comes into domain adaptation in a whole number of places. And so people have studied this quite um, seriously at a theoretical level and beyond. And so there's this interesting thing, which is that uh, it's provable that to, to accurately estimate this density, what you can do is instead of estimating this density and then this density and taking the ratio, you can instead build a classifier to predict which of the two densities X came from. And classification is a way easier problem than density estimation, like much, much easier, more statistically efficient, and so forth. And so we basically uh, converted this problem into one of building a classifier. Uh, and it's kind of a very simple move, but from, a, I think, a pretty deep insight, not, not made by us, but repurposed by us. And, uh, and so actually, you can, you can show that for this density estimate, we have not shown, but it's actually provably optimal among a very broad class, class of estimators, including the ways that people might current, like, there are other ways people have been doing this that, that we do, that, and it's, it, it also beat, it should beat that. Um, if, if these models are correctly specified, which you know we're using machine learning, so they're not going to be, but still, it's a strong statement. Okay, so so what are the advantages here? So there's a number of them. Is I've turned this problem into a classification problem, which already is actually just advantageous because classification is sort of a really solid, uh, solidly solved problem, and so we can plug and play with any modern day uh, machine learning classifier. Uh, including classifiers that can take variable length sequences. And so we're actually not gonna do anything super clever. We're gonna throw these short reads, these long reads that are overlapping, not overlapping, actually into one of these classifiers that's meant to handle these kinds of things. Um, and right, in particular, short, long, anything. And it also naturally is going to account for the level of evidence that kind of gets obliterated when we take the, the ratio. Um, and it turns out it's also uh, has a lower variance estimate uh, even in the standard setting. Like if we go back and apply this to places we've just used the standard thing where we don't have these problems, it actually just works better. And so, uh, oh, I said that one twice. Uh, oh, okay, let's skip those. Okay, so, uh, so Akasawa, uh, Akasawa Buzi, who's actually graduating for anyone in the audience is definitely uh, gonna be looking for a job. So she did a really tremendous amount of characterization through a, a large range of simulations on short, on long, and sort of centered on various real data sets, so like our uh, AAV, a recombination library, and so forth. You can read the details when it uh, comes out. And, and actually, I have to say, rarely has a student shown me a plot that is, is like this good in the sense that, so here is, our method is what we call model-based enrichment. 
And so this is, each of these is a data set. And so this is how well um, model-based enrichment works in terms of spearmen with the ground truth. And literally, this is how well um, the, what I would call the next best competing <laughs> approach does, which is actually not the, the, so the CLE here, this is what we call the count-based logged enrichment. That's literally the bare bones ratio I showed you. And we do something a bit different than that. Uh, we have been where we do, a re basically we do a regression on that. So first we compute that, and then we regress on it. That's actually this blue point. And this is what we've been usually using. And so you see these huge, huge differences in many cases. And so it actually really surprised me, but I, it seems to me that this method of estimating these log enrichments is actually incredibly powerful. And so this is on what I call the estimation task, and the, meaning that what I do is I, um, I train the model on the data, and then I just use the model in sample on the data in the way that you're trained never to do in machine learning, right? You always go out a sample, but here we're just saying, I'm gonna use the model to clean, you know, to, to estimate directly in a sense. And so this is just for estimation, not prediction. It's on the training data itself, but, uh, but it speaks for itself. And then a separate task is, um, is the prediction task, where now I do this, but on out of sample things, which is what I want to do when I do protein design. I want to, when I'm designing new libraries, this is the task I really care about. Uh, but I wanted to mention the other one because I think it's a classic scenario that people are still quite interested in. And again, uh, you see, and so I should say back here, uh, some of these don't have, um, uh, uh, okay, never mind, never mind. But uh, right, and in this case, prediction, for the raw count-based log enrichment, that basic definition, you can't make predictions, right? It's just like, it's like computing the mean of something. I can't predict what it will be. So uh, there's no pink points here. It's just the two methods of building a model. One is how we used to do it, which is compute that count-based log enrichment and regress on it to make the prediction. And then this is this new method. And again, we see pretty big differences in a lot of cases. And, and then, um, and then now on real data, because of course that's what you always want to know. So real data was quite a challenge. So the problem here is where do you get ground truth? Because we can't use the log enrichment that classically is used because we don't believe it's a good estimate. So you know we can't use the estimate from any of these as the ground truth. So basically, Kosovo had to go find places where they'd done sort of you know real biophysical assays or something that's not sequencing based. And as you can see, the sample sizes are very very small. And um, but actually, if you put these all together and you do a statistical significance test, you'll see that it is significant. And in every case, even with these tiny little sample sizes, you still see a win, which I think is pretty astonishing. Um, and maybe just in closing, this one last thing. So this is something we really care about. And um, these are these neat plots that she devised. This is somewhere where we care about selectivity, where we want to infect one cell type, which I call the positive fitness, and we want not to infect another cell type, which we call the negative fitness. And so I don't have the plot here, it's in the paper, but we can show that we're much better also at doing negative fitness. And because we're better at negative and positive, when we want to find something that scores Basically here, it's scoring really well. It's really infecting the cell type we want, and it's really not infecting the cell type we don't want. That's basically, this is the theoretical ideal. And if we use our approach, um, model-based estimation instead of this, uh, this competing one, then and you, you, there's a sort of algorithm basically because you have now two fitnesses. So basically you take the top 10 of, I, actually I'm forgetting what it is. Uh, there's some way where you basically using the model identify what you think the most selective ones are that are closest to this point. And what you see is that model-based enrichment gets this sort of cloud of points and the other method gets this. And if you take sort of the center of mass of these, you see that on average we are much closer to the theoretical one. So stands to reason that we'll do better, uh, this is simulation, so we have not done this on, on a real experiment, and we see that um, sort of systematically, sometimes more dramatically than in other scenarios. Okay, um, so right, so that's that's the end of that uh, vignette or story or what, if you will, and so I'm just gonna have a, a like an overall concluding slide for the whole talk, uh, including the beginning and like this whole field, like just what are my overall thoughts? I, I, I have to say, I've, I've, as Caroline said, I've meandered through many, many areas, and I've never been as excited as on this one, although it also corresponded with starting a group at UC Berkeley, but I really think is a fun area. And my, a lot of my colleagues, I don't hear it in biology circles, but my colleagues are 
many of them walking around a bit depressed after Ch of GPT-4 came out. They're like, I, you know, I don't know what should I be doing. <laughs> and so, you know, and, and I'm and I'm I'm really I'm pretty I don't know for sure, but I would bet like my mortgage in Berkeley that there are several startup companies that are VC back to do like GPT-4 for protein design. And I and I and I don't think they're gonna <laughs> I don't think we're gonna just have some general purpose foundation model to design proteins. And in particular because it's just you know what they had you know sucked up from the web for GPT-4 was like you know all of like training for law school for med school it's all there but all of protein engineering is not known let alone let alone on the web right so just think it's really a different game uh, and I do as I've said I think alpha fold is too is really game changing it's going to be a great tool for protein engineering but it doesn't solve it I think that predicting and understanding how we get the function is very important and very very hard and even though I'm in this field like I feel like it moves so quickly that I can barely keep track. So if I've missed something, please send it to me. <laughs> okay, thank you. I guess we have a few Thank you very much for a really, really great talk. Yes, we do have some time for questions. So questions. And I don't know, I'm not keeping track of the Zoom, but maybe we'll also check afterwards. One of the first things you mentioned. Sorry, can you talk to the mic if you have a question? One of the first things you talked about in your talk was how uh, the physics-based methods were failing. Are is there any hope for the physics-based methods, or I mean, is that is that like maybe in refinement, or is that just sort of a failing? Um, I'd say they're not working as well as what uh, like they've been essentially the energy function from Rosetta has been replaced by AlphaFold2. And even though AlphaFold2 is ostensibly to go from sequence to structure, it's being repurposed for all kinds of, of other ways. Uh, it, like they, it, you know, in a sense it has like an API. So it, you, you know, it needs to take templates, needs to take a multiple sequence alignment. And by doing a whole bunch of weird stuff, you can repurpose it to actually score um, docking uh, docks of proteins and things like this. Um, and, and embedded in, there's a nice paper by Sergei, of, of, I don't know how you say his name, of, I don't want to say it wrong, but I want to try to say it, Ovchenko, does somebody know? Of Chinnikov, thank you, thank you. So he has this beautiful, one of the few beautiful papers around in, in a lot of <laughs> bad, bad papers, he has a beautiful paper hypothesizing that, uh, that there is this implicit energy function with alpha, fold. well, obvious, I guess it's obvious there is, but and what, the, what the multiple sequence alignment is doing is helping you index in the right part of that space really quickly. And so all that is to say that, um, that on the one hand, like AlphaFold is this sort of energy function that has replaced it. And I don't think people are going to work on those other energy functions anymore. So I, it's hard to, like, they've been improving over the years, but I think AlphaFold the, was such a huge difference that I think it, I, I, I mean, I don't work on those. So, but I mean, I don't see David Baker's group. I think they're working on machine learning now, and I'd be very surprised if they go back to that. Um, but also, there are places where AlphaFold at the moment isn't good, and there's no other models. And then that's when people back off to the energy model. So my prediction is that slowly, the energy models will become obsolete, um, rather than that people will make them better. Go ahead. Oh, thanks, John. Thanks for the nice talk. Um, I was curious for the AAV design where you have these seven amino acid stretch and you showed that uh, you could predict packing efficiency using either linear models and the neural nets and the, the neural nets were like slightly better. Yeah. Um, I should so, say those linear models had like epistatic terms and so forth. So oh. they're not like just site-wise independent. One of them site-wise independent, but we added. I mean, so that, know, was, that was exactly my question, Jennifer, oh, I see. which was like, um, are you just doing better at modeling the epistasis in the neural net? Or you know, we what didn't do you think poke, is... In other projects, we've been poking a lot into this. In fact, like the one where I said inductive bias. In fact, the inductive bias we've been thinking about is precisely like a, a basis, set of basis that captures epistasis in a more natural way. Mm -hmm. And in some sense, you can actually capture any fitness function with just linear regression. You just need high enough order epistatic terms. And if you go all the way, it provably can capture anything. But we didn't poke into that in that in this particular scenario. Yeah, so I guess I'm just curious, what do you think the ballpark of the amount of epistasis there is in a seven amino oh, that's acid a stretch? Great question. I think there's definitely pairwise because I think the linear I think the site wise one was not very good, but beyond that I don't know. Um, yeah, I, sorry, I, I didn't spend a lot of time on that problem thinking about that. 
But I mean, I could go. I mean, I could even go back. We could look if you want. Uh, although we're running out of time, and I'm, I know John's going to ask something funny. So okay, wait, because he has the best auto reply. Yeah, I didn't think when I woke up this morning that I'd spend my Friday night reading about how to normalize read counts, but now I'm going to, and that's, that's exciting. <laughs> uh, getting back to what you, the idea that you can take function and go back to sequence. Mm. As a biologist, how should I think about how to even phrase what function I want? Like, it'd be one thing to say, well, I want GFP that excites at 480 nanometers instead yeah. of 484 yeah. nanometers. Yeah. But that's, you know, kind of tweaking at the margins. I can yeah. also do that in the lab. How do I even think about, like, what, what functions will I eventually be able to ask of these models and get a sequence back out? I feel like there is a lot of questions in there, and I'm, not, I'm trying to organize them in my head. Um, I mean, one. I feel like one thing you were asking about is like maybe how precise can they be? Uh, I don't like. I, you might have to go back because I like. I, I like to reshape the question as I'm pondering. Uh, I mean, how do I know what to ask for? Well, in some sense, like you, we, if you're. I mean, suppose I like right now when I talk to protein engineers that I might work with or I work with, like they already know what they're trying to design, so they already know what they're asking for, right? But like if they want. But if they're really trying to explore. You know the the all the you know there there are more proteins there are potential proteins than atoms in the universe. That means there are functions that we don't even have words for. Yeah. So, but my the people I'm working with are typically trying to do things like that have a specific design goal. Like I want uh, AAV that uh, can go into a glial cell, right? Right. And, and so, so those are starting with they're starting with a with a known function, and they're trying to make it. They're trying to move it a little bit in one direction. Well, like for example, there's cells they literally can't basically infect, right? Right, like so you're, try, you're trying to get it to bind to something new. But to me, that, that's different from a... Maybe I'm, I'm thinking about function is going beyond just sticking to something. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, we're very good at, you know, our, we, we generate antibodies that stick to all sorts of different things. Yeah. And so that's just a, a, a very localized binding interaction. It's actually it's a, very, very hard to design. Like, no, I know, yeah, yeah. like, that's already hard. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, but you know, when when we're asking, like, well, could we engineer a protein to do something new? How do what, what does new even mean? Like, just sticking to something different, to me, that's less new. Is, are you quibbling with the use of the word new and asking me not to use it? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think. Uh, uh, I, I guess it's it's. I, I, is there is there more to it than okay? I want to I want to bind to something different. Mm-hmm. Like, could I really, could I come up with, like, okay, I want to be able to take a substrate and convert it into a different product in a way that is, that no one's thought of doing before. And if so, how would I go about doing that? I mean, I think we already have so many problems with the stuff you would say is not new. Like, that's interesting, but it's not on my radar. <laughs> and I should be very clear, like, binding to other things is actually very, very cool. Like, <laughs> um, I, it's not something I've thought about. I think... Often we know their known properties, thermostability, immunogenicity, binding, efficiency, and so forth. And it's just we don't have the right combination of those. Uh, and we may have, for this particular thing, never seen that one good enough. Um, but I, in terms of what is totally new, I feel like that rem it reminds me of this idea of like, look, I designed a de novo protein, right? This is like yes. a big thing. And then it's like, well, what is de novo? Well, yes. it turns out it's something like, I don't know, some percentage nucleotide different or something. And you're like, okay, well, but actually, and, and I don't know also why, like you took the catalytic site you already knew about, and then the rest is like different. And, and I, I don't know, it's a very... It's a very strange game that I don't completely understand. I think I, uh, yes, I know what you're saying. Yeah, that makes, that, that resonates. <laughs> Thanks, so Denver. I, okay, okay. <laughs> Sounds like a conversation. Oh, there is one more question. Okay, let's do one last one. Um, hi there, thank you. Um, the way you quantify the ratio is really interesting. Um, I noticed you use the Spearman rank coefficients. Mm. Um, how does the different scores compare if you have a different size library? So for really large, those 10 to the 7 libraries, you have a very large negative, you know, zero, zero inflated negative binomial distribution of the recounts. Yeah. Um, but as you reduce the library size, the, yeah. the distribution changes and yeah, yeah. then your, you know, relative magnitude of your log fold changes. So how does that value compare? Uh, can I use this, uh, uh, are, those, are those magnitudes comparable between 
libraries of different sizes? So I don't have the table, but there's a summary in the table. So she mm -hmm. changed various factors, including the length of interest, whether the short read, whether it was a long read, how large the library was, and so forth. I don't know if she hit the parameter uh, setting that you're talking about, uh -huh. but uh, if you look and she didn't and you think it's an important one, please let us know and we'll try to do it. Right, yeah, it suggests <laughs> that um, um, the, I think the table was talking about, it's have higher co correlation to the ground Wait, truth. you've of, seen of the, the table? It wasn't oh, in the, my... The one you applied oh, yeah, just no, now. No, 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 I mean the table in the paper. There's a okay. table in the paper that's not here. And okay. it, I think, should be available tonight that tells you all the simulated data. Like, it's a very... Okay. She has all, unlike a lot of papers, this should be, like, actually reproducible science. It has a lot of information uh, in it, so... Okay, thank you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> thank you very much, Jennifer, for a really great talk.